Welcome to the Graybar G2 Talk Webinar Series. I am Tony Frantel, National Product Manager with Graybar. At Graybar, we continue to work to your advantage by bringing topics that are affecting you on a daily basis. We want to be your trusted advisor uh, and help bring ideas and solutions that help you manage your networks with speed, intelligence, and efficiency. We are excited to have you with us today as we discuss passive optical networks for the government. Our industry expert today is from Comsco, a global, global market leader in infrastructure solutions. Joining us today from Comscope is Kevin Gleason, Director of Technical Sales for the Federal Team. The webcast will be 30 minutes in length, followed by a Q&A for 10 minutes. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation, and we will address them at the end. Depending on time constraints, some questions will be answered following the webcast. Also, for the first 50 registered attendees, you'll be receiving a Starbucks gift card for a free coffee. Thank you again for taking the time to attend this webcast today. And with that, I would like to hand off the presentation to Mr. Kevin Gleason with Comscope. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So as Tony mentioned, we're going to be covering passive optical network solutions. Comscope is really excited about this solution. It's uh, It's been a part of our offerings through our broadband division for a number of years, but we're very excited on the, on the federal side to be looking at it as a solution. Today what we're going to be covering uh, on the agenda is what is PON, which is fundamentally what is the, the, is the network solution, some of the market drivers, uh, PON Basics, basically looking at the, the different solutions that are out there, uh, EPON and GPON. We're going to look at the components, both active and passive, some of the driving standards, and deployment designs. Now, we're unfortunately not going to be able to go into a great deal of the detail. And one of the things I'd like to mention up front is this slide deck will be made available. And there's some of the slides that have build slides that are very valuable in the way the information is provided. So I'll try to step through where the slides had to be flattened uh, to make them more understandable. So when we look at what is passive optical networking. It's a telecommunications network uh, solution that uses point to multipoint fiber. And what that means is we're basically taking a single mode piece of glass. So if we look at the bottom illustration, there's an OLT. So imagine a that yellow line is a single strand of single mode fiber that goes into a splitter. These optical splitters could be 1 by 2, 1 by 4, all the way up to 1 by 32. What they do then is they take that single uh, transport signal and split it out to all of these ONUs. Now, these are optical network units. These would sit at the desktop. They could sit in a traditional TR. But basically, that's the interface between the optical network and then back into a copper-based network. So in the illustration, what we see is we see an OLT connected by a single mode piece of glass, split, then out to individual work areas or multi-work areas. And then from the ONU, it would be a Category 5E or Category 6 patch cord. The great thing about PON is the distance between the OLT and that ONU, unlike a traditional enterprise, can be up to 20 to 30 kilometers in distance. So what it allows you to do is to centralize that OLT and then to disperse that out to a larger enterprise network, not constrained by a building. Normally, we would see a switch like this in a building serving that building. This could be a campus head end feeding that. So PON history. Well, you know, this came out of the telecom industry. So think about the broadband, the, um, the, the, the regulated side. They were looking for more bandwidth to their subscribers, to their end users. They wanted to take their aging infrastructure and replace it with a fiber. So you saw that push to put in fiber. They wanted to reduce power requirements by limiting the amount of active equipment. And they ultimately wanted to reduce OPEX costs. These are still very much drivers in the enterprise space that we're looking at. Proven technology. This has been really around in the market since 1995. So there's nothing new about PON. When we currently look at PON today, it's driven by two standards, uh, ITU, International Telecommunication Union, GPON, or IEEE, EPON. So it is a standards-based solution to offerings out there currently. Comscope has both E and GPON solutions. So it's really been a 15-year investment in sort of perfecting this as a network solution. 
you know, globally when we look at it, they're predicting uh, this year for almost 25 million deployed ONTs desktops. Now, this is global, uh, not just in our space. What you'll hear a lot is you'll hear about the, the widespread adoption. And it pretty much falls into, if you understand what Fios is, like Verizon has a Fios fiber to the home, these would also be counted in those deployments. So it's not just in the enterprise space. So we look at a typical campus solution for PON. You'd have, if you look in the lower right, there's a network enterprise center. Consider that the head end. That's where we would have our OLT. Then using that single mode fiber glass, we would go through the optical splitters and then pick up the buildings. Later on, we'll look at more specific applications. Unfortunately, we can't go into a great deal of detail, but you'll get the flavor of how this will work. What this allows you to do is it eliminates a lot of active equipment servicing all those buildings. So from a centralized point, using that OLT, we can support multiple buildings in a campus or in a base. So we look at in our space, we consider the enterprise space. So within the building, we could have the, the OLT getting the signal from the service provider, then using our fiber distribution system, again, single mode, we could go into our riser, and then once we get to the floor, we use our splitters either located in the TR or in zone boxes, and we get out to the work area. At that point, a desktop ONU, and let me point out something I didn't make clear before. Uh, ONU, Optical Network Unit, also sometimes referred to ONT, Optical Network Terminal, just to be clear on that. So this is how it would be deployed within a building. And we'll look at some details of how and where you put these different uh, passive components. And again, the passive component is effectively the splitter. So some of the drivers that are out there, since this is a, 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 a fiber media, there's no emissions from the cables. So the, the government is very interested in low emissions cable or no emissions. It's centralized and thus secure, so they can control it. There's no active equipment that can be accessed uh, in the buildings. Uh, we can converge voice data and video into a single fiber, so we can definitely save on pathways and spaces. We can uh, improve reliability. Installation time goes down. Operational training costs go down because we don't have multiple network systems in place, and we get enhanced performance. One of the primary drivers is no electronics between the data center and the desk. What that allows us to do is we remove or, or reduce the number of active di distribution layer switches. And since we've removed those, there's no need for backup power or cooling in those closet or areas. It's a very green solution because we're lowering the cost, both the CapEx and the OpEx. We're, we're reducing the power requirements and the space requirements because we're not using those spaces for traditional deployments of switches. One of the big drivers, and this is one of the slides that you'd be interested when you get the slide deck to, to uh, have the full deck because you'd be able to see there's two memos here. The primary memo was back in April 2010 where the CIO of the Army, uh, General Sorensen, sent out a memo and said that all camps, posts, and stations undergoing modernization shall ag aggressively adopt GPON and broadband wireless technologies by fiscal year uh, 2013 in order to decrease operating costs and capital expenditures. So the general hit on those two specific points of operational costs and capital expenditures. So that drove the Army and other branches of the DoD to start looking at it. The memo was followed up in May of 2012 when Major General uh, Knapper wrote that for all new construction and all major renovations uh, to utilize uh, GPON technology and it says any deviation to the requirements to utilize GPON for said projects will require a waiver from, uh, from NETCOM. So basically what this did is it put pressure on the Army to look at ways to incorporate PON solutions into their offering. I would point out that it mentions GPON. Basically that means gigabit PON. We're not specifically referring to IU, ITU uh, GPON. When it was first written, there was, there was only one 
approved uh, platform, and that was GPON. But since then, and I'll talk about that later, uh, EPON is approved for use in a DISA network. So some basics. Uh, and I'll say something about the title. So I uh, put GPON or GEPON. Uh, that's how we refer to it when we went through certification. But, but basically it refers to Gigabit PON or Ethernet PON. So on an Ethernet passive optical network, we're using an 802.3 standard, and it's a subset of Ethernet. And what we have is we have a symmetrical transport um, downstream of uh, 1.25, and then we can also support 10 gigabit as well. What we're doing with uh, GPON, or gigabit passive optical networking, we're under the ITU standard and it's 1.24 up and 2.488 down. To point out that there's still the the, the appliance bottleneck, it's, it's still going to be gig Ethernet or 10 gig Ethernet. So the 2.488 was primarily for broadcast technologies downstream. That's why there's there's more capacity downstream. The difference is, is that uh, EPON uses Ethernet data frames where a GPON uses an encapsulation method using gem frames. So basically packets or ATM transport. So we look at the architectures, they're very, very similar. Uh, we have a OLT going into a splitter to an ONT or an ONU, and then to the desktop with copper cable connecting the devices. The, the architecture is the same, what difference is the, is the transport of the OLTs out to the ONUs. It's important to note that you can't intermix GPON and EPON technologies within the OLT chassis or with the ONTs and the ONUs. So we look at some of the apparatus that's out there. The component parts are OLTs, usually come in large and small chassis. We have ONUs, these are what provides the interface at the desktop. They come in a couple flavors. They come in desktop versions, you see there's a, a Wi-Fi ONU there uh, that also has uh, access ports to plug in. We have multi-user ONUs, which is 1 to 24 ports. These can be used in the place of distribution layer switches in a closet, in a consolidation area. One thing to note, there's a small device there towards the left that SFP ONU. This is a small form factor pluggable ONU that on our EPON solution can be plugged into a legacy switch, and then it would convert that appliance into a ONU. We look at the bottom, we look at the OSP passive enclosure uh, solutions that are out there. Again, this came from the, the sort of regulated carrier side, so you'll notice that there's a lot of OSP solutions. These would be um, devices that would be at the central office in the vaults and then at the, um, the homeowners or, or, or customer site, and those would be the network interface devices, the NIDs, and the ONUs that would plug into it. So this would be how they would support sort of a fiber to the curb solution. When we look at the enterprise space, we start seeing things, oh, excuse me, uh, let me just go into detail on the, the OLTs for a minute. The, the, the two strategies shown are, are, are pretty much what you're looking at, and, and we're not specifically talking about Comscope, but we're using these as examples. When you see a large chassis, and the one shown on the left is an 8U chassis, this has eight uh, a port pawn blades. It can support up to 4,096 ONUs. Now this is based on a 64 um, sp fiber split. And the same thing with the smaller chassis, that's a 2U unit that can support 16 pawns and 1,024. You can see that even in a very small space that pawn pre presents a very scalable network solution. Now we would never do a 64 pawn split, it would be a 32, uh, 32 split or below to manage the bandwidth. Now if you notice on the left it says JITIC, UCAPL, that's the certification by DISA for the US Army uh, certification we went through, Joint Interoperability Test Command. So we had it certified and it's also listed under the UCAPL or Unified Capabilities Approved Product List. So this solution is approved. Currently, uh, in the industry, there are 
three approved solutions. Others are going through, but there are three solutions. We are the only one that has an EPON solution that is approved. The two other solutions currently approved and the ones on track are, are uh, GPON solutions. We look at the ONUs. These would be the desktop units or the large group uh, units. You see also the ones that were JITIC approved. The top one in the left is a one in four port commonly deployed at a desktop. The, the Wi-Fi unit, that one is not currently certified, but would be available for use in non-DISA uh, network operations. The multi-user on use shown, uh, one is PoE. PoE is very important. That's the 7024A on the bottom. That unit allows you then to power the device centrally from the ONU. These are normally found in closets or in, in large workgroup areas where they would need effectively a switch like this. So I mentioned EPON and GPON. So there, there are basically differences in, in their transport. I mean, the, the Ethernet is used widely in the enterprise space in North America. And it's commonly used for delivering of IP data services, VoIP, IPTV. We're falling under the IEEE standards for 1 and 10 gig for it. And it's pretty much widely adopted. And we're seeing a lot of drive for that. And that's why we chose to uh, drive our JITIC certification to EPON. On the GPON side, we also have a GPON solution. It's an ITU standards-based solution, but it, it was primarily came out of and aimed at the telcos or the, the service providers, provide cable services, and they're looking providing triple play services. It's an ATM-based solution for voice, Ethernet for data, but it's using proprietary encapsulation to, to make that uh, packet communicate. So when we're talking to the networking folks, what they understand is layering. And what you see is that we're looking at effectively three different protocols to allow the, those, those applications to be supported, whereas we look on the EPON side, we're pretty much seeing it's, it's Ethernet all the way through. And that, that for folks who are used to working with Cisco gear and everything, they get it. It's, it's Ethernet all the way through. So we look at the, the drivers out there. It's, for EPON, it's all about Ethernet technology. The knowledge base is out there with the technicians. They know how to work with it. They can do the command line. It's very easy to interface with. Operation and maintenance, very similar. It's interoperable with all Ethernet devices. It's a clear path to 10 gig. We are currently uh, driving a 10 gig chassis through that same JITIC certification I mentioned before. Uh, we feel that that's a, it's a requirement, so that would be 10 gig PON into the workgroup area. So the standards that are out there, well, we're, there, there really is not any current ITU standards for the enterprise space. And this is where it gets a little challenging for us on the enterprise side and the structured cabling side is how do we put PON into the infrastructure? It's a, it's a single mode fiber media, but what they, the standards in the 568C, what they're asking us to do is two fiber or higher fiber counts to the desk area. They're also telling us on the splitters that they should be connectorized and not part of the cabling subsystem. What that means is that we're not splicing in a splitter it actually becomes a point of administration. We want to make sure that it fits within the supportable distances. So one of the things we're trying to do here is make sure that PON fits into the structured cabling system. We're going to look at some examples where the, the way they do the topology of it, it may not support that, that type of, uh, of an infrastructure. Sorry for a little bit of delay. So we, we think about our, our infrastructure in the enterprise space. We think about some, some typical components. And what we have here is we have uh, fiber apparatus for mounting in a rack. But we also, if we looked at the other solutions, we could also have wall-mounted splitters and different varieties. When we think about the enterprise space, we think about a structured cabling system. What's shown here in the center, the cassette with the tails on it, that's a splitter. 
could be 1 by 8, 1 by 16, 1 by 32. It would fit into a panel. So you think about your typical infrastructure in a TR, this would fit into a fiber shelf. The one just below it is a fiber splitter that is in a shelf or component form. The other pieces we need are the structured cable, the cabling itself. Uh, what's shown is, is single mode fiber, uh, a multi-fiber cable, but it's also showing an armored cable. Uh, on this call, we're not going to be covering secure fiber, or I mean secure pond, the, often referred to as SPON, but it's definitely something for a follow-up discussion. But what that is is basically taking an interlocking armored fiber, running a alarm carrier signal across it, and to know if anybody's tampering with it. So it fits into and replaces traditional hardened PDS solutions. So it's definitely something we should do as a follow-up uh, educational seminar. We look at the components here. We have work area outlets. We have patch cords, both copper and fiber. We have connectors for field termination. One thing I'll have you notice is there's a lot of green here. And the reason why it's green is because those are APCs. Now, what I would point out in the design architecture is where APCs are usually critical is at the ONUs and also in the splitters. So there's a certain amount of hyper design when we're putting together a pond structured cabling plan. When we're looking at it, there'll be both APCs and non-APCs in the solution. So understanding that's very important because we're not going to intermate a single, ma single mode APC uh, connector with a UPC connector or a flat polished connector. Uh, there will be a high level loss and it just will not function properly. So when designing the system, we have to keep that in mind. But in all other things, it looks like a traditional structured cabling solution. Now, one of the things you'll hear when you're talking to uh, end users, it's all about, they'll, they'll talk about getting rid of the TR. And that's something we'll talk about in these, these examples that are, are coming up. We want to look at how do we take a structured cabling system and have it mutually coexist with a pond deployment. Sorry, I'm a little, little delay on my slides here. There we go. Okay. So some common pond deployments. Now, this is another slide that would be very helpful if you got the entire deck. Um, there's actually five examples. There's only three shown here, but there's actually five examples, and I'll kind of go over them. So if we think about the equipment room or the main distribution area, having an OLT in that, the top example. What it's showing here is it's bypassing the TR. And this is what a lot of times people say, well, we don't really need that TR anymore. And that's a big play in the hospitality industry because they can take that same amount of space and use it as, as, as a rentable space or a hotel room space. So they're saying getting rid of those spaces saves a lot of, uh, saves a lot of money. Uh, in the enterprise space, that might be a false economy, but we'll talk about that more. So the OLT is in the ER bypassing the TR, so just going up the riser. The splitter box is shown in a zone box area or consolidation point. Then a single mode piece of fiber goes to the ONU or the work area, to the work area faceplate. And then we're connecting into uh, copper patch cords into the devices. The second example shows the splitter in the TR. So taking one of those rack mount appliances, uh, a, a panel, we're running the fiber to that, mounting the splitter there, then running the single mode out to the work area again to the faceplate, connecting the ONU, and then out through our uh, copper patch cords into the devices. The third example is the one I would point you to if you get the slides, and I'll kind of go through how it's set up. There's, there's, there's three versions of that solution. So from the MDA, we have no active equipment. So this would be the example, as I showed at the beginning, where we had a head-end situation or a, a central location where the splitter uh, would be in the, in the building, in the main distribution area. Then we would run single-mode fiberglass up all the way to the ONU. So in this case, it is running point-to-point -point from the uh, MDA all the way out to the work area. The next variation of it, what you're seeing on your screen, is we're actually taking a multi-user ONU and placing it in the TR. 
So now the fiber splitter is in the is in the base of the building. And now it goes up to the multi-user ONU and plugs into it. Now the example shown here is legacy switch. That's the third example. Now if we have an existing installation that has distribution layer switches in each of the TRs, we can take this SFP ONU, plug it into uh, the SFP port on that switch, and now it functions as a multi-user ONU. And that's the example shown here. Then what we'd be doing is reusing the Category 5 or Category 6 distribution cabling that then would go to the work area, and then we would connect as a normal Ethernet network. So it allows you a lot of design flexibility. There's a lot of different ways. Pretty much what the design is about for PON, when you're thinking about it, is where do I put those splitters? And what type of ONU do I use? Do I focus on desktop ONUs, multi-user ONUs, or in the case that's shown on the bottom picture, is I have an SFP ONU, I can take a legacy infrastructure and convert that into a multi-user ONU and actually save money by reusing existing appliances. One of the big challenges of PON is the transition between, and it's mostly seen as a greenfield solution, but and if it's a brownfield solution, we're going in and augmenting a current network. This is a great way of doing it. We take the SFP ONU, we plug it into an existing switch, we can reuse the existing copper-based infrastructure, thus saving the customer a large amount of money. I would point out that currently the SFP ONU uh, is JITIC certified. And I'll give you an example of uh, so how that application will work. In this example, we're seeing a, a OLT, again, the existing Ethernet switch, we plug into it. This is JITIC approved. Uh, it is the only one uh, that is in the, in the US DOD that is on the UCAPL and has JITIC approval. But this allows would allow the, the government to use reuse existing appliances, uh, network appliances, and repurpose them. So it extends the operational life of them and allows for a easier transition. So in summary, you know, we, we feel that 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 EPON, you know, uh, really reduces, you know, the uh, we would say the enterprise network cost, but definitely PON capital cost because of that SFP ONU. We we have a lot more flexibility. Now, if we if we use EPON, which is Ethernet, we can make use of existing investments of network equipment. You know, with a 20 to 30 kilometer reach, we allow a lot more flexibility in where we can sort of collapse that traditional network design and get rid of those pieces of active equipment, again, saving money, saving energy. You know, PoE is, a, is very important to us, and we think it's a major consideration when you look at PON, is how the powering is done. And really look into that. And if you get the opportunity to talk to your folks at Graybar and Comscope about this, that's definitely an area that should be further investigated because there's a lot of solutions out there that talk about PoE, but it's really about how am I going to power that unit and efficiently back it up and support it. Uh, really to us, it's about uh, 10 gig, both for the enterprise side in a traditional space, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig migration strategies. We definitely need to make sure that if you look at EPON, that there is a 10 gig supported solution. We do have that. And we really, since, since Ethernet is the, is the de facto solution, network solution that people turn to, we have to look at the future and the applications are going to be supported. And, and really, we look to the IEEE and we look at the extended reach of EPON uh, going out to 30 and beyond uh, kilometers of support. So again, adding a lot of flexibility. So please contact us at Comscope through your Graybar representatives. Uh, we are the only manufacturer offering both EPON and GFON solutions. We end up, and we are a total turnkey solution, a one-stop shop. Please give us a call. And with that, Tony, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and just a reminder, for those that have questions, uh, you do have that Q&A box. Feel free to fire in some questions. 
Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in right now. Um, uh, one of the questions, uh, and, and we kind of address this throughout the presentation, but the question is, uh, you know, why is JIDIC uh, certification so important, Kevin? So it, it, on a DOD network, what they're looking at is they're, they're looking at interoperability. So the, the interoperability is a very important issue with the government. They want to make sure that whatever systems are there are not going to conflict. Um, they also want to look at it for security reasons. So what's what's good about JIDIC, and the reason why you should bring it up, even if it's, um, let's say we're at a Department of Energy lab and it doesn't really fall under DISA requirements, the fact that we've gone through that process, they realize it's a level of certification that, that takes away the worry from them. Definitely in a DOD network, anything that rides on the DISA network needs to be uh, uh, DISA certified through the JIDIC process. So that's why that's fundamentally important, but tangentially it's important because it really gives them a level of trust about the about the network. Also getting a question here, Kevin, on uh, integrating uh, existing horizontal copper infrastructure. So basically, can I uh, integrate PON using some of my horizontal uh, copper infrastructure I have in place currently? Great question. So when we look at our existing infrastructures where we would normally find single mode fiber in the backbone, excellent. Uh, you know, where we put the OLT, where we put the splitters, can ride off of that. If we're looking at traditional copper-based uh, distribution systems from a TR, the example of given where we could take a multi-user ONU that has uh, it's 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 basically a pawn in and then copper out that would fit and ride on that solution. If we had in a situation where we had uh, existing network switches that were in the TR, again using the SFPO and you, we could plug into it. And that would allow us to reuse that appliance and fully support that infrastructure. So it's a very good question, and especially when we're looking at larger bases and facilities that have an outside plant uh, fiber infrastructure. Th the great thing about it is we're only using a single strand of glass. Now, one of the things I'd like to point out is when we're thinking about our, our enterprise infrastructure, redundancy has always been a very important thing for us. We want to make sure that, that we do have redundant paths and be able to support that. So again, where you put that splitter and how you design it, you want to put that into the into the discussion. But definitely in a traditional distribution system, Pond can be overlaid in it. There's, there's two solutions that can support that. Uh, we've got another question coming in as well. Um, and I, I noticed we do have a couple that are a little more in depth, a little more technical. And, and just so you know, everybody who, who does have those questions, we may uh, uh, defer those uh, after uh, the webcast, and we'll, we'll get back to you on those because they are a little more in-depth. Uh, but one question that did come in, uh, is the EPON uh, compatible uh, with the uh, current Cisco uh, VoIP systems? So, so interoperable, absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's, it's definitely a, a, an interesting question that we could take another direction as well. When we talk about specific solution providers, whether it's Cisco, Brocade, Interesis, whoever it might be, the, the interoperability with those systems is also dependent on access that they allow. Um, currently, uh, the major switch vendors do not have a PON strategy. Um, we, we, we believe that at some point they, they will enter that, uh, uh, enter that fray, uh, and come out with, uh, pawn chassis cards and, and, it, you know, as it, as it matures. Um, but as far as VoIP systems, absolutely will support them. That was one of the concerns, uh, that when we went through testing was interoperability with all of those systems that the Army would, uh, be deploying or on a DOD network, and VoIP is definitely high on that uh, list. Um, I, I, I saw a question on the ROI case studies available for energy cost savings. Really good point. Um, there are some, there are some, definitely some studies out there. There's a lot of claims being made uh, by our competitors and just in the industry in general. Re really what it takes is, uh, and this is really where it's a value to the, the customer is to take their specific requirements and then show them where the savings are. Clearly the savings for lead, you are, you are removing active equipment, you're removing the supporting infrastructure that goes with that. Um, that can be written into um, 
your application. Uh, so definitely lead is a very important thing. And it's, again, energy savings and resource savings are, are one of the large areas we're looking at. Okay, and then uh, one more on the infrastructure itself. Mm -hmm. Um, any concerns if you know if they, there's an existing single mode fiber infrastructure in place? Um, you know if it's not Comscope, uh, any issues there using a non Comscope solution for that? So we often see that. So we're we're often riding on other people's glass because there's existing infrastructure, whether it's dark fiber that was put in on the the base of the facility. Um, the only thing I would point out is that I, I would definitely encourage them to look for uh, zero water peak fiber, uh, OS2 fiber. Um, a lot of people don't understand the difference between OS1 and OS2, but a zero water peak fiber is something you want to drive to. Uh, it just makes a better you know, overall investment. But that's, a, that's the specifications we would uh, ask them to have. It would be OS2 fiber or zero water peak fiber. OK, great. Um, one other quick one, and then we're going to wrap up here just because we're, we're running short on time. And like I said, I know there was a couple additional questions that we'll be following up after the webcast uh, directly with those folks. But uh, one came in, um, you know, you went through a lot of uh, different components there, electronics, um, and a question came in, you know, those Comscope does provide the electronics as well. Just wanted to, uh, you know, just drive that point home. That, yeah, uh, that's absolutely, that's yeah. Right, so so Comscope has both the, the the passive components, which is the splitters, the cable connectors, all the apparatus for the physical infrastructure for layer one, and we have the OLTs and the ONUs uh, that were shown in the slide deck. Um, I would definitely recommend when uh, talking to their gray bar representative that they get a full brief on the solution, both E and GPON. Uh, it is a full offering. Uh, and again, the only unique difference, uh, there's a few ONUs that are different, but when we're talking between E and GPON, one of the unique things is the SFP ONU that is only available uh, in the EPON or Ethernet PON solution. But yes, we do have the full electronics and would love to come out and talk to you about it. Well, Kevin, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, Thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate everybody's time. I know everybody's extremely busy. Thank you. Uh, also, a special thank you to Kevin Gleason uh, and Comscope uh, for their time and, and help and expertise in, in bringing this webcast uh, today. Uh, this presentation will be on demand uh, at the address uh, listed on your screen uh, at the uh, graybar.com website. Uh, and we'll also be sending a link out to all the registered attendees, and you should be getting that tomorrow. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. Thank you.